Alrighty then, welcome back to another episode of the NTA podcast, the wonderful and the most fun podcast, Linux and other stuff podcast on the interweb, in my opinion anyway. And with me as usual is the boss and the wonderful Big Bod. Hello. And the fun, the funny, always funny, so, so funny. Josh, I would like to think that I'm not going to be funny today. Just mm. saying that. Now I might be a little sarcastic, which you might find humor in, but I'm but I'm not intentionally going to be funny today. Okay, if you say so. Well, I oh. know so, because uh, I have a confession to make, right okay. here at the very start of the show. Mm -mm. Uh, you here see, uh, there is a community of people. Mm -hmm. that refer to me as Gentoo Guy. And um, uh, I have a confession to make to everybody. Uh, this For this episode, at, at the very least, there is no Gentoo in the making of this episode. Say what? There is no Gentoo here. No? I, I oh. have left Larry the Cow behind. How many, how, many, how many angels have fallen? I don't know yet, but... Uh, this might ultimately turn into Gen 2 installation number 48 in the past year and a half if uh, Ubuntu fails me. And may I ask, why did you decide to go to Ubuntu? Uh, so, Ubuntu had this fancy new release come out like a few weeks ago called an LTS release. And I was looking at that and I'm like, you know what? I'm kind of interested in it. Because uh, they, they have this thing called ZFS enabled in the, like as like an installation option which i did take that by the way just to see if like uh i could be a zfs convert but uh the big appeal of ubuntu is that i wanted a gnome desktop right and i wanted yep. a gnome desktop and an operating system that's not going to change something out from under me over the course of like the next year or two <laughs> now uh well, big pod, i know to, that... now to big do pod. it for two years <laughs> big pod I know that you you were trying to find some way to plug an atomic desktop. No, I we wasn't. Oh, okay, okay. I'll uh, just let you know that that might still be in the works. <laughs> I was trying now, to ask you if you're gonna be able to stay on that install for a <laughs> for a year or two. Uh, it depends if it breaks. Oh, uh, so, no, so no. it breaks, the answer is no. Uh yeah, because you know I'm using I'm using snaps literally to record this episode right now too. I'm using the snap of okay. OBS Studio as well as the snap of Chromium, which I'm using to talk with you guys. <laughs> and that's not a problem. Yeah, it's, it's not been a problem yet because you know I have I didn't realize I was using the snaps until if if you're five saying, minutes before we started. <laughs> if you're saying if you're say, if you think it's not gonna break Big Pod with Josh, Josh manage manages to break <clears throat> anything. I know. Uh, it can, I it have will broken break. zero Linux. Yeah. Well. Yeah. All, all I did was install zero Linux. I booted into it, and it crashed three minutes later, and wouldn't re and it wouldn't reboot it back into a live operating system. Yeah. <laughs> that happened. <laughs> well, you're you're kind of you remind me of Chris Fighter's deck because but Chris yeah, Fighter's uh, deck breaks everything. <laughs> uh. So, and the main reason why I wanted this stable base for it, for a period of time is because I'm going to get excessively busy because uh i'm i'm actually going uh mm -hmm. i've been volunteer told into a, a few things around here where uh if you don't know what volunteering is is basically where i've been forcibly volunteered <laughs> to uh help to help in this thing uh it is it is involving the a my my small local village government it's going to occupy a lot of my time and thankfully they are going to compensate me for this so uh okay, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh I might not have time to install a Gen 2 system. <laughs> well that's a different story then. <laughs> that's a different story. Yeah. you you've been voluntold into something, but normally you'd be in in your daily normal normal daily life, you would be on Gen 2 in a gym. Well, of course. Uh and I wanted to use Gen 2 for this thing too, but uh that quickly turned into a really bad idea let's be honest let's be honest <laughs> uh, uh, we we joke around a lot about this uh 
but we all know by now that Josh, Josh's uh, uh, home is Gentoo. No matter where, what he tries, no matter what he uh, uh, opens his mind to, it's always going to be Gentoo in the end. Like for yeah. me, for me, it's always going to be Arch. No matter what I try uh, in the interim on other machines, it's, but I always come back to Arch. So everybody has their home. Everybody has their home. Yeah. Now, uh, to further touch on why specifically I chose Ubuntu and not like another long-term release distribution like, you know, Debian proper or Linux Mint or anything like that. Uh, it's mainly because, you know, Ubuntu does this one, one thing that I can actually align with. And that's building their packages correctly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, you know... Firefox, I can watch my own live streams in, unlike with Fedora, where it, I can't watch my own live streams on a Fedora system using their their Firefox binary because uh, they are missing a DRM modules. And I don't know which one it is. I haven't been able to find that out. But, you know, the flat pack for Firefox still works perfectly fine, or the binary that you can download off of off of Mozilla's website works fine. So That's it's gotta why be RPM. I always recommend going with a flat pack. Yeah. And uh, there's also other reasons why you should go with a with a containerized version of a browser. I mean, security uh, the, being one of them. The containerized application sandbox is slightly more uh, appealing to me, as you know, like my interest in like these atomic desktops grow and all, and all that. And uh, you know, like I said, I don't want uh, something to just come out from under me and just like do a change. Like you know, uh, there's a wire plumber coming. Uh, update that came out recently that mm -hmm. is breaking everybody that wrote a Lua configuration because you know wire plumbers deprecating support for Lua configuration they're moving to a YAML system if I remember right oh my god y uh, yeah yay so I didn't good. know that good yep hmm. I, and I found that out the hard way thanks Gen 2 <laughs> <laughs> well well I, I haven't found that out until now and uh, well I don't know uh, if, uh, if you did not write a custom configuration you no, won't even notice it <laughs> I haven't. I haven't. I don't touch it. Because, Neither have I. Yeah, I just I? use. Uh, I just use. If I want to record an application's audio, a specific application's audio in OBS, there's this uh, app, audio Pipewire application audio. Yeah. Pipewire. Uh, but you know, when you write your own wire plumber configuration, you can rename the audio devices to something that actually makes sense to you as well. Because yeah. uh, you know, I have 32 devices connected to my home computer, that all report as audio devices. <laughs> well, the same thing and with Q QPW Graph. If you use QPW Graph, you can do the same thing. Yeah, you you can, but you can also disable them in a configuration file. So that way, you don't have to keep disabling them. They're just disabled. Yeah, but uh, your your configuration has been causing you problems for a while now. It has because you know I'm an idiot. But uh, let's move but on. But <laughs> maybe if you, if they were using a proper configuration language instead of a programming language, maybe those problems won't be there. I heard since you you you've been talking uh, about Ubuntu and you being on Ubuntu right now, I've seen this Reddit thread about about people hating on uh, on this distribution. Do you do you agree with the with what's happening? Do you are you seeing yourself people hating on Ubuntu for no reason whatsoever? What do you think? So, I think that's an interesting topic, right? Because uh, there are some things that Ubuntu, that Ubuntu does that yeah, people don't necessarily like. Uh, specifically, mostly things that Canonical has done. And uh, that really doesn't, sometimes doesn't affect Ubuntu at all. And a lot of the hate for Ubuntu is actually just hate for Canonical. Yeah. Uh, like this Reddit thread at, uh, this I've seen this Reddit thread too. Uh, we'll have a link for it in the show notes in the description. Yeah. Uh, and the very top comment on it, if you sort it by using just the default uh, Reddit, Reddit sorting, literally says... I've been watching quite a few Linux channels recently, and they do not hate Ubuntu at all. 24.04 was well received. The only complaints right now are snaps still being forced on the users. Wow. I have news for you. Ubuntu is not the only distro forcing these containerized applications on people. Have you looked at Silverblue? Yeah. 
Uh, <laughs> I think that, like, yes, 2404 was well received. But when you look at post launch time, when people just talk about Ubuntu, there is always something that they just nitpick about. And there is a reason why. It's why it's popular hating on Ubuntu and Canonical. Simple as that. That's yeah, the that's the popular thing. That so, is a good point of view. Yeah. Yeah, they're gonna hate on it just for the fact because it's popular to do so. Because well, there's, that's what there's... garners views, and that's I don't know that's that's the job of a content creator to to get views. That is that is one thing, and there's another thing. Like Josh said uh, earlier, it's the fact that uh, what's been going on with Canonical and especially with with their um, pa uh, package manager, where they had packages that weren't uh, that were uh, crypto crypto hmm. packages. Yeah, well, at the that same time, that happens same time, on Steve. user curate user created repositories. We always have yeah, that. yeah, but. That that's a thing that can happen on Flathub too. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm going to stop you right here, Steve, because okay. uh, I have an opinion as a guy that that actually used to run a business. Now, how many packages are are on the Snap Store right now? Do you know? No, mm, tens of thousands, probably, if not hundreds of thousands. But not as much as the other package managers. I know it's not as much as sure? other package managers. But uh, you got to think about. Okay, I guarantee you. That there's at least a thousand packages, right? Yeah, maybe more. Now, this is a these are posted onto Snapcraft, the central repository for snaps, and yeah. Snapcraft is curated entirely by Canonical, because oh. and and because of this proprietary nature, Canonical it's on Canonical to scan and sort through all these all these package submissions for yeah. the, for the Snapcraft store. Now. If you're a company, how many maintainers do you need to constantly watch Snapcraft? Quite a few. Not many, but yeah. more than one. Now, <laughs> these people need to know how how the Snap tooling works. And yeah. they need to have at least some knowledge on compiling software. And they need to have some knowledge of programming on top of that to be able to audit the source code of the software that's pulling in to make sure that the software is, you know, not shady. Mm -hmm. So now you need now you need to not just hire moderators, but you need to hire ba basically people with at least some level of development experience. That is true. Preferably some of which that have experience in your tooling. Because I guarantee you, not, there's not that many people that know what, that know whatever language Snap is written in. I think it's written in C or maybe Go. I don't remember off the top it, of my head. It's written in Go as far as I remember. Yeah. There, there's not everybody's a Go developer. Hmm. But, you know, it's not like Go is particularly difficult to really pick up if you already know yeah. like a C-based C language. But that costs money. And, yes, I know that Canonical makes money. But it's not like that they make so much money that they can, that they can just go out and blanket hire four thousand some odd people. <laughs> no, no, I I do agree with uh, w uh, with your argument there, Josh. But uh, although I do agree, it's so no. If well, they want, hang, if they hang want, on, to, hang on, want, I, okay. I'm going to continue. So what Canonical decided to do for this curation was to just run automated checks against every single package submission, against like these co these common things that they found, that they submit to. It's basically, just think of it think of it as like a basic algorithm, or, you know, if you don't know what you're talking about, it's called AI. Uh, but, uh, and they, they did this for like an automated purpose because uh, it's what a lot of companies actually do. It's literally, it's probably literally the same thing that Microsoft does for the Microsoft Store. Yeah. And uh, you know Apple probably does it to some extent, and I know Google uses automated curation as well. Uh, as well. Now, uh, they do this because you know they don't. They can just develop one algorithm using a team of like a hundred people rather than you know four thousand people to to constantly be hired and watch this thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, they they've let this run, 
and you are going to have issues with this. That is an accept. That is a risk that they decided that they were going to take, and of course, it bit them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. True. Now they did come up with a response to this. I believe that they are now doing hum hu uh, human curation as uh, now yeah. to for like reported packages. So uh, something that the Flat Hub uh, is has been doing for a while. Yeah. And Flat has been doing that for a while because, you know, they've got people actually volunteering to do it for them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, basically, we are the guinea pigs and we uh, we volunteer to be the guinea pigs. So uh, but here's my it's not an, uh, I, I do. Like I said, I do agree 100 uh, percent with what you said, but it's canonical. They have a they have an image to maintain so they cannot ship something that will tarnish uh, that image at the same time. Are you sure about that? Because Canonical attempted several times to come to make the the very unpopular thing. Uh, the question is, why would that? Why would that? The fact that something got into the store be an unpopular thing? Yes, like these kind of things will happen. It's a user. It's first of all user uploading service like user uploads packages it's not they have certain gates you have to go through but at the end of the day you upload the user who the, or the package yeah really. but it's not the aur <laughs> if you want yes. something that, that that is completely I mean, jungle jungleified. To be, okay <laughs> to be fair steve have you looked at who maintains the flat packages that you're installing on your system basically is every anyone. single is is every single one actually being curated by the developer of that no. package? No. 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 It, no. It's by a volunteer person. The Steam package is unofficial. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, anyone can create a flat pack. Yeah. yeah and I, a lot of these flat packs call PK exec commands. Yeah. yeah. So they're calling root privileges that you're letting them <clears throat> run on your system sometimes. And if you yes. and if you know if you know what you're doing, you can very cleverly hide a, uh, any kind of malicious code into that actually re real and good package. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not going to be before long that we start seeing very similar things coming out of FlatHub too. Yeah. Like, it's just a matter of time. If you want to get it, you're going to get it in. Well, here's, here's the thing. Uh... I would uh, I would say that people hating on Ubuntu, like uh, Bigpot said, they do it because it's common and it garners hits. It garners uh, negativity. I mean, negativity as a whole garners viewership. Uh, yeah, and uh, we hate on Microsoft Windows for many of the same reasons. Yeah, because you know exactly. it's yeah. popular. Uh, so, that said. I have an appreciation for Windows because Windows does one thing really well that all the other operating systems don't, and that is called legacy support. Nobody tries harder to support legacy software than Microsoft Windows. Uh, I also have appreciation for Windows. One of the things that Windows does way better than Linux is memory. Yeah. Not usage memory, of memory, me memory but... Memory management. But memory memory. when you yeah. actually you fill up your memory, there is, there is a good chance your Linux system will just fall over and and reboot windows doesn't do that windows just kills the thing that is that is that is least used even if it yeah. cannot page it down it onto a drive it yeah. will just kill uh, the thing and go on compared yeah, we, to on linux where we have systemd umd which just kills the the thing that's using all the memory <laughs> yes if that happens because even that thing needs to needs to use memory which means if, yeah. if it cannot use the memory this thing just falls over and dies so sooner or later. Yeah, but well, Linux is going to get there. We just got the ability on Plasma to, uh, for, for the, if the session crashes, it doesn't take everything with it, which Windows has been doing for ages. That is to be a probably that needs to really be a kernel, kernel level thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that but said, it isn't. Uh, I want to talk about some of the unpopular things that, Ubuntu, that Canonical has pushed into Ubuntu. Uh, yeah. Ubuntu was a fantastic distro for for like the first few years that it came out. Everybody loved it. And then uh, Gnome decided that they were going to come out with Gnome 3. Yeah. The very first thing that Canonical did that got everybody really mad at them, 
you know, after, you know, disabling root, lo root login by default, uh, was we go we're going to come out with a new desktop environment. Cool, you yeah. know, a new standard is exactly what we need right now. Yeah. I am they lying. came out with Unity, and Unity sucked. Uh, uh, I am it yeah. sucked for a while. The big benefit of Canonical is, with all the hate that they were getting from Unity, they stuck with it. Yeah. Until, until like, GNOME 3 was good. It, yeah, until GNOME 3 got good and Canonical just no longer saw a point in trying to maintain Unity. <laughs> Which, Unity yeah. ended with a fantastic uh, release. Uh, uh, Ubuntu 16.04 is still, hands down, one of the best desktop experiences that I ever had. Hmm. Just saying. Uh, it, yeah, it works. well, uh, the, I'm going to say this. Uh, uh, Windows has its advantages and it, its disadvantages, but the advantages it has over Linux, Linux uh, is barely getting there. <laughs> it's like Linux still has a lot to do to get there, but it's getting there. But we needed to get there faster because yeah. we're, we're starting yeah. to get this feeling where uh, if we want uh, this part, uh, this thing, we need to go to Windows. We need to stop having this itch to go back to Windows because Linux is not doing it yet. I'm not saying it good. I'm just going to say not doing it yet. Like I said earlier, uh, the, 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 the feature where when the session goes down and doesn't bring any everything down with it, we just got that on like, I mean, Plasma. That's Kwin crashing. Kwin Kwin is a Wayland compositor and is maintaining your entire desktop session. So of course it was going to kill everything. Yeah. But not anymore. They fixed yeah. that. So it took them a few years. We got there eventually. We we, we had similar issues back in the day with Xorg, where where the Xorg server itself would crash and take everything with it. Yeah. <laughs> Another unpopular thing that Ubuntu did was they had in in the what's it called in the search in oh the, yeah the the amazon integration amazon, yeah affili uh, affiliate I, integration okay i lived through this period of time and i can't tell you how many times i would open up the dash and start typing and stuff just to see like porn ads <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that was a very common thing you'd want to yeah <laughs> I, I bet uh then of course after that came the good old release of snap which which is still controversial and it's after controversial that, controversial to the people that just actively hate Snap. Yeah, <laughs> and after that came the great no. Firefox to Snap, okay, which is okay, a okay, far okay, more okay. complex issue than just that. My, I will have a, co a controversial opinion. Right, it's now. not just Firefox that's Snap by default anymore. Yeah, Thunderbird is too. Yeah, this is going to be my very first uh, controversial uh, opinion. I hope and last one, uh, but. I did like snaps. I do like snaps still. And I will tell I will I will tell you why. Recently, I added the uh, chaotic AUR repository to uh, to my uh, Manjaro installation. This sounds like a mistake. No. This sounds like a horrible mistake. No, 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 no. That's I know what I, I know what I'm doing. I've, I'm I'm an Arch user. I got experience. I know what yeah. to install, what not to install. Arch, I'm, we signed up for this. I'm yeah. not sure you know what you're doing. No. <laughs> Just by adding. He's about to find out what he's doing. <laughs> it's no, no. fine. It's fine. No, here's ahead, what happened. Steve. I was like, I, I I've had uh, Plex installed on this because it's my HTPC uh, for the past twelve uh, one thousand. 238 days exactly. No issues whatsoever. So when I added the chaotic AUR repository, I was like, okay, uh, my, plus, uh, my uh, Plex server, media server, was installed via Snap. I was like, why not uninstall it and install the one from the chaotic AUR? <laughs> and there's the, the bad thing you did. No. I remembered that if I install from regular repositories, all the data and the metadata storage of all my movies and TV shows are will be yeah. in a different place. So It'll I will be have in a to place. You gotta you gotta sit yes. there and re copy it over, move it to the appropriate place. Exactly. If you want yes. to just import it. But here's what I liked about 
snaps because when I uninstalled the snap version of, um, of my Plex media server, it created a backup yeah. of, of the data folder. Yep. And then when I realized that the chaotic AUR package did, did not detect my, uh, my metadata folder and I had to do all the moving manually, I was like, uninstall the chaotic AUR version and reinstall the snap version and, re uh, and bring back the, the snapshot of, uh, that it created before uh, it uninstalled it. And that took me 15 minutes and I was back up and running. I was like, I'm not touching uh, my Plex Media server. Leave it as a snap. I'm not going to yeah. have to, to redo yeah. the whole thing. So uh, this is something awesome. Why don't other package managers do that? Create a snapshot of packages. Uh, some yeah. do. Some do. Some do. S some don't because the problem is how they work. Uh, snap works m a lot different than, than yeah, but that uh, that RPMs. feature is amazing. Yes, it it's is. Like but it, it saved me. It would be it saved really, me. really, 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 really hard to achieve by something. It is actually a package manager, like I don't know, uh, the package. Let's not, let's not even go into the realm of Pacman doing it. Uh oh, Pacman. <laughs> <laughs> the no, Pacman is Pacman. Uh, the reason. The, the reason why, first of all, all the packages that are before today, let's say the, today we implement this feature. All packages from before wouldn't know what the hell, what the hell the directory is. Want to know why? Because they wouldn't be anywhere defined. Because you would need yeah, to true. define a data directory where data would be. Another problem is that since you're not defining a directory, you need to change the packaging format quite a bit. And so on and so on and so on. Yeah, There's a, a lot, lot of, of problems. This is what the benefit is of the the containerized package managers because they actually are aware of where things are happening yeah. inside their file system. They can be, which cannot be true for no, RPMs and stuff like that. No, here's the thing. With uh, various package managers, it's, uh, they put everything all over the place in your home directory. Whereas Flatpaks, for example, containerized, uh, packages they put everything in a sim in a single folder that's it they don't go all over the place everything is centralized actually, in one area le actually those package managers don't put everything in their home directory there's programs to do it package managers don't so, do home directories really because they can't how many package builds for arch linux have you actually read steve yeah a lot why Okay, so you know that AUR packages typically compile in the .cache directory in your home folder, right? Yeah. Yeah. Have you read where, where some of them get installed? Sometimes, for some of them. So, uh... Okay. Uh, I know that, like, there, there's a couple packages. I, I can't name, I can't put, like, their names off the top of my head. But there, there are some that install into slash opt, which I'm fine yeah. with. There's some that install into slash user slash bin which i'm yeah. fine with there's some that install in slash bin which i don't know if i agree with then no, occasionally no. occasionally i see one that just drops it in slash share or slash user share and they drop the, user share. drop the executable yeah. binaries into there and then there's others where i see that they make a new file in the root file system and and you know, just install itself into that directory. I've it's, even seen some some that just create a whole new user account and then just run it inside that user. Yes. Well, yeah, those are very yeah. rare because now I haven't seen them. Now, now one now. thing they can do ha is, or uh, they can do, but they won't because it's really, really, really hard. Edit your your home directory. Want to know why? Yeah. Because they run as root, so how will they know who, who, which is the user that installs them? Yeah, that is the big problem. That, that that is a big problem. That's causing me a headache. No, that's not a problem for a for a RPM package. <laughs> that's or, by design. <laughs> or no, no, no. For me, for me, for... it's causing me a problem. For me, because there are a, a few packages that I uh, that require files to be in the home directory that I'm having to do via Bash script <laughs> and uh, and all this. I. It's something I would wish for, but I know it's not I'm never gonna happen. I'm gonna, I'm gonna then tell you afterwards what you need to do. It's gonna what? it's a horrible solution, but yeah. What? Uh, set UID. Oh yeah, that's I could do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, I want to transition us again to a topic that is very 
important in my mind because BigPod here is going to help me understand because I am currently a baby in this field. <laughs> uh, how do we beginner developers choose which language to begin with? Uh, okay. I, I chose Bash. I don't know if I made the right decision. But let's see Big Pod or Josh first. Let's see. Well, Josh. I'm going to give my opinion first because I know that Big Pod is probably going to have an opinion based off of what I say after he after he has an opinion of what you're going to say, and he's probably going to start with me because I'm going to say something very controversial. You start with Bash, right? Yeah. You you learned how to create a for loop in Bash, right? Yes. You know how to call an end to a script, right? Yeah. And you know how to ru- how to run integers. No, you know what yet. variables are? Well, yeah, variables, yes. I okay, use functions okay. and whip tail. That's where I go okay, right now. Okay, guess what, Steve? What? That is fundamental in a lot of different programming languages. Just that little stuff. Yes. Bash scripting is basically programming. However, Bash itself should not be a programming language. Uh, yes. That's, it's, it's, a, it's a language for scripting. Uh, Big Pod, you can break that down a little bit further because, you know, you probably break it down a lot better for me. But... Uh, Bash is great for those little things that you just run every now and then. Now for like a whole insul- now for a whole uh, distribution installation toolkit, probably not the best choice. Probably not, but that doesn't huh? mean that it won't work. Huh? Yeah. Now if you, if you're looking to start a project and you're new to programming, just pick a language and go. And not go to the language, just go with whatever language you pick. Yeah. <laughs> that said. Golang is actually not really that hard to, to uh, pick up. It's actually fairly friend. It's actually fairly friendly for it's a really, really fairly simplistic. low level language. Yeah, it, it it's pretty. It's easier to learn than Rust. I've tried to read in Rust code. I cannot wrap my head around that whatsoever. So, uh, go. If I had to choose one, I would go with Golang. However, Python very popular. In fact, you can go to free freecodecamp.org right now, and you can learn how to write Python. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I've got. I've got, the re, that's what got me into asking now, this question because everybody was telling me Python, 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 Python. Yeah, because you know Python is a great universal language to uh, Python you know, is a logical with. step above Bash. Yeah, yeah, it is a logical step, and you know, for a lot of things, Python can do it. Now, the issue with Python is that it's an interpreter language, which basically yeah. means that every now and then you're going to have a Python call that might take a second, because you know it's got to pass through the interpreter interpreter then it's got to got to do whatever processing that uh for the data that you put into it and it's got to send it back to you back well, to the interpreter of course of which that can take some latency time because you know it's got to take time to uh put in the extra background well so same then, thing same thing with yeah. scripting in bash yeah and bash is also technically an interpreter language but uh that's when you look at other languages that you know actually get compiled or you know their interpreter is just faster lua <laughs> okay but uh you know that's when you look at the next step up but you know you you gotta start somewhere yeah <laughs> uh big pod you go right ahead i'm so sure that you can expand let's on that first start with the whole premise of premise question which is how to choose the right language the okay, right please. choice at the end of the day is wh- what you know. That's first right choice, first to think about. So, for example, if you know, if you know, I don't know, I always choose C sharp because it's the language I know the best. Mm-hmm. But there, there are certain things I don't use C sharp for. Why is that? That is because C sharp isn't 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 good at everything. So that's the, that's the choice number two. You have to find the right, the right language for the right job. I, I was wouldn't going to say that. pair C sharp with making an operating system, or no. making something something to extend container stuff. For that, I would use Go because it is a far more container centric language, or more specifically, container world is very Go centric. Docker also, is written in Go. Yes. Ah, also, Docker is written in Go? I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, Podman mm-hmm. as well, and most of Kubernetes stuff is written in Go. Same I would if I need if I would need something that goes incredibly fast, like it needs to be really, really, really fast, 
I was probably writing Rust. Of course, I need to learn Rust, but yeah, it would be worth for me to learn Rust because I would I would need that speed. Yep, and Everything, of course, Rust being Rust, you will never stop learning Rust either. Yes, but you never stop learning any language, really. But there's a point what... when you have enough knowledge that you can write stuff in without like going. Uh, and you and you then use Google for everything else because, well, reality is <laughs> yeah. you can't remember uh, every Google call for every library. You need to use documentation, so you need to normally find the documentation for that library. But what's the n good progression? Uh, of course, Bash is a uh, good scripting language. It's, for me, the rule I, I really keep is 100 lines or more more than few loops slash uh, if statements. So if, if statements, switch statements, whatever, uh, the, uh, how to say this, in branching, to do some sort of branching. Yep. Because that, that code then becomes a lot more complicated and has a lot more complexity and decision making to it. So that might be the natural stopping point to go to something a bit more programming uh, focus. So that would be something like Python or in my case, it's normally C sharp, but not always, as I said. Well, uh, like you said, uh, use the right tool for the right job, basically. Always. Uh, Another uh, consideration I forgot is knowing uh, what libraries you're going to need. So if a language doesn't have a certain library to interface with certain thing, let's say you want to make a virtualization, something to control virtualization, I don't know, using libvirt as a, as a backend library. If your language doesn't have a uh, not have a library to call libvirt there is no there is no point in using that library that, that, or that language so you need yeah. to make so you need to make make decisions with actually like it's not like today when you see certain developers just go i'm going to use rust because it's the the language the meme language to use sure well, that's an option but it's not really a well thought of choice and if you're not if you're not doing it for some sort of points internet fame points you'll be you'll be using a more logical decision making process in choosing your language like the one i outlined uh, during during my monologue well, yeah well for me well, for... alternatively you could also just be like hey i want to learn a new language so i'm just gonna write this pro this project in this language it's also an option for you, but that's yeah. th that's again. I mean, that's a part. That's of literally the whole... what the guy with like uh, Bash top, and Pi top, and C top, and all that that stuff does. Yeah. He's just like, I'm gonna write the same program in a new language just so I can learn it. Yeah, yeah. For me, for but me, you're probably so not far... writing something really serious at that point. Yeah, well, for me so far, it's it's been Bash. I've been feeling at home with uh, with scripting language basically a simple bash scripting language how many lines uh, of code do you have the the biggest document uh, uh, script i ever wrote the longest one was around 300 323 lines so um, way too much does it feel like it should stay with a, as a bash script steve well i know there are languages where i can su uh, not, make that not, into 20 yeah, lines but do you feel do you have the feeling that Bash is probably not the best tool for the job at that point? No, I still don't have okay. that feeling. Okay, then it's still perfectly fine in my personal yeah. opinion. Because I have a Bash script that is literally 1,400 lines. I know someone and who wrote a game in Bash. Yeah, and you know what? It still functions. It does exactly what I need it to. So I don't want to write it in anything else. And this Bash script has all the for loops all of the while, while loops, all of the external calls. It's got a lot of stuff in it. It takes some time to execute. But at the same time, it works. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, uh, do should I re rewrite it in another language to echo out some more performance or because you know it's the proper thing to do? No. 
Yeah, no, because this one works. And yes, it is a bash script. Exactly. And it's a very long bash script. And, you know, it's a very messy bash script to look at, but it works. At least it's not Pearl. <laughs> if it works, it works. That's enough. Yep. Unless exactly. you really need certain parameters to be either faster or better, then you go for the uh, uh, rewrite. But if it if if it's something works, no matter what language it is, whether it's Bash, Python, C Sharp, or any other language, even Rust, if it's if it works, don't rewrite it for the for the hell of it. If you're rewriting it in another language to learn that language, that makes sense. Like, yeah, you already you already understand the program you're writing. It's like so you're writing translating one better. language to another, basically. Yeah, you're yes. acting like a translator. Kinda. Yeah. But the the thing is that it's likely they're gonna write it better anyway the second time you're writing it. Because well, now you know what you're doing. Or at least you have a better idea. You might not know what you're doing, but you have a better well, idea. Well, you you know what you properly know what's the end goal and how to get there. Yeah, you you have that bet much better of that idea how to get to the end goal than you did the first time. Like, yeah, like uh, I'm so I'm. I, how can I put it? Uh, I feel so comfortable with uh, bash scripting that. While we were talking, I just wrote another script. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm so comfortable, with it. I'm so that, comfortable with it. I'm so comfortable with it. That's fine. Because, you know, it, if it's functioning for you, it's fine. I, Bash is a great Bash is a great utility for just, like, hooking a bunch of different things. Uh, basically, all Bash scripting does is it's executing binaries on your system. Yes. That it's you can just commands. use natively to begin with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, like I was talking and about. It's just, or... it's just a method of automation. Yeah. Exactly, and uh, and and I want to say one thing. Uh, it it ties in with what I'm doing uh, now is that it's it feel uh, scripting feels so natural. Uh, like writing bash scripts feels so natural. It's because I'm telling it what to do very easily. It's like uh, and the way we learn how to write bash scripts is okay what do i do on my system i do sudo pacman syyu for example because to update the system so i just throw that in a text document i do i run this command and this command instead of just having to remember these commands i just throw them into a text file rename it to uh, dot s give it a dot sh extension add the shebang at the top and add a description uh, uh, echo so it says what it's going to do and that is a script done yes yeah. it's, it's so and, much uh, fun it, it's great that we can do that because uh you know uh if you couldn't do that with computers then computers just wouldn't work anyway because i'll be honest with you as a guy that has delved into a lot of links distributions there's a lot of them that use a lot of bash scripts for a lot of things yeah yeah and especially like hey the latest, the tool that was be, that has that, that was used for decades or for a long time, not decades. NeoFetch, that was a bash script with I don't know how many tens of thousands of lines, eleven thousand lines. Yeah, uh, a lot of them were just ASCII images, but yeah, yeah. It, it, the point stands. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this so, box is written in Bash. Yep. Or yep. actually, it's oh. as far as I know, it's actually comp uh, Polis compliant shell, but. Yes, it's similar. basically bash. Yeah, <laughs> it, but, it runs in a bash shell. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, uh, so I'm like, I'm uh, it. I finally found something that puts a smile on my face. Like recently, uh, this is this is the thing that's been putting a smile on my face. And then I did, rediscovered Docker. So that's a subject for another day, but. I'm just saying that Linux as a whole has become interesting again for me because, wow, I'm discovering so many new things. I mean, the benefit of Linux is that you can always find an excuse to find something to do or yeah, find something exactly. to learn. Yeah. And uh, is that is the biggest benefit of the Linux ecosystem because you can grab all this stuff and pull it down. It's the same thing that they're using in the, in the big leagues 
and you can read a man page about it. Yeah. And and I just remembered as we were talking about the bash scripting. I was basically bash scripting since the Windows days because I used to write batch scripts. Yes. I mean, uh you you want to if you're okay, so I'm going to say this here for the listeners, right? If you open up a terminal and you write more than one commands, command so say like you run your sudo apt update and then you run your sudo apt upgrade to update your Ubuntu system. Guess what you just did? You have yeah, two ri- commands. Written now a program, you basically. Just put them into a file and execute that file. It's going so to do exactly sudo, the same thing. So sudo is a binary. Apt is a binary. Update is an argument of apt. Yes. And then you hit enter. You executed a bash script. <laughs> yep. Kinda, <yeah>. So <laughs> that's why bash scripting feels so natural because you're already using the things you're already used to doing them. It's just that you're just looping them into uh, loops that you could just call in terminal anyway. But uh, so that way you can index things like this monster, this monster bash script that I have. It's it's the script that handles my my complete and entire backup stack. Zero. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So what it does is it pulls in it pulls in uh, an hourly check against my uh, desktop's desktop's home directory. Uh, it tells my desktop computer to take a ButterFS snapshot, of which right now I'm using ZFS. It's not going to work. But so and then it pulls it in hmm. uh, onto uh, my local server, which then it takes another snapshot and dumps it off to my local backup server. Which then, at the end of the week, we'll take another snapshot and send that off to offsite number one. Which then, offsite number one will take another snapshot and then send that off to offsite number two. Oh wow! Yeah, wow. and this one, this bash script is executed on a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, yeah. The now, only reason of course, I know for bash for loops is because I use it. Like in a one liner in a terminal. I I write a file with list of I don't know commands or arguments for the command for the commands I wanna run and I write a simple for loop that takes the every single line of that file and executes it as a part of the part of some command. Yeah, and I guarantee you that if you're ever working in an SSH session on a server and you just want to be able to just like move or just like rename a bunch of files at once. That is a great excuse to learn how to write a for loop in Bash. Yeah. For this file using these search parameters, I want you to move this these files to this, but name them this. <laughs> yeah. It, it it's a great excuse to learn a little bit of Bash scripting right then and there. And I guarantee you that if you sit sit there and take the time just learn like the basics of Bash scripting, and and uh, you're looking into a career in systems administration. That is a great head start. Because uh, what is a sysadmin going to do at, at the end of the day? Run a automated bunch of scripts. And yeah, he's he's going to have things automated, then he's just going to run scripts. Yeah. <laughs> or at least that's what that's all a sysadmin should have to do. <laughs> well, when I was working at the uh, at the plant as an assistant system admin, uh, I saw the head system admin, the main system admin, create a lot of batch files because we we were using Windows Server 2003 back then. Of course. Uh, uh, it was 2009. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, uh, he he used to write a lot of batch, batch, script, uh, batch scripts. Uh, I don't know why on Windows it was called batch. And then and batch commands, that's uh, basically... Basically, one command after another. Yeah, and yeah. and com files. Yeah. Uh, there was something called dot com files uh, on Windows. Bec- every time Win, because as everybody knows by now, I've said it a million times. We got electricity issues, and the power goes down, and mm-hmm. uh, there is only so much time the UPS can can last before it shuts down. So he was writing all these batch files and comp files to every time the system goes back up it relaunches the some services in the in the background that don't have a service 
to be a startup service to be run. So uh, yeah, and and that's where I got my beginning into scripting, basically. And it was I've, I I loved it, and I'm, this is something also. Uh, sometimes we start our programming adventures in the least places ever. I mean, the the very first piece of software I ever wrote was a World of Warcraft add-on. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Gaming. <laughs> I was Gaming going to is say. a great excuse. Yeah. Just Gaming. Get into Gaming it. Gaming is a good, uh, great like, gateway. Uh, yeah. It, it is a fantastic gateway. And, you know, mod developers would like a, like a little bit of help. Or, you know, modding modding a game can actually be very fun. Yeah. For example, yep. I started by wanting to ha to no to have uh, statistics, and I didn't want to manually put them into Excel every time. So what I did, I I wrote a wrote a program that had like a nice UI with selections and yeah, really easy to enter things instead of and a giant Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, and uh, the be the big benefits of like Excel or, or like a uh, video games is that they already have your development environment running. Yeah. <laughs> so all you have to do is, uh, in, the, in the case of World of Warcraft, you modify your your uh, file, you hit save, and then you go back into the game and just type in slash reload. Yeah. <laughs> Where you don't have to wait for it to compile or anything because, you know, it's just a live interpreter because most of the time it's just a scripting language that you're writing in. Yeah. But it still teaches you basically the fundamentals of everything you need to learn Unless it's, unless you need to learn a C point or which uh good luck, there was a book written by uh, Ken Thompson about that one. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, I need to uh, get ready to uh, shut things down. Uh, that was a that was a good episode. We talked uh, quite a bit on a lengthy about Ubuntu today. <laughs> that I was mean, an interesting... uh, I I apologize about that because you know it's my new operating system. I gotta be a show now. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> uh, guys. Uh, give us some feedback. You can go to contact at tuckspace.com. We actually got a p piece of feedback that we that the three of us need to discuss on this real quick. Uh, that's why we're not mentioning it right now on the show. But hey, uh, thanks for thanks for sending us the sending us in the email. Uh, every time you send an email to that email address, the three of us receive it all at the same time, so we can all read it at the same time. So I don't have to forward it to anybody, or like Big Pod doesn't have to forward it to anybody. And you know. We could reply to it if we wanted to. I don't well, know if yeah. anybody has replied to this guy yet, but hey, uh, we'll let's uh, we'll we'll discuss that later. But anyways, I love reading feedback for the show. Uh, I was looking at the YouTube channel the other day. I haven't looked at it a whole lot because you know the videos uh, don't seem to be pulling in a lot of views, which I get. We're a small we're a small show, and you know some of the comments in there. Having pretty interesting reads. Uh, I I need to like go through them again here and re read them. But anyways, I I appreciate all of the feedback that we've been getting for the show, uh, and it's all been very very warming. And I'm glad that uh, you you have taken the time to either watch us or listen to us. So yep. thank you for that. Uh, and like I said, uh, we are we are discussing like. Uh, ways to like help fund fund the show because you know uh, this podcast is self-hosted yep and of course when you self-host th things like a podcast that you want other people to have access to there it's not free <laughs> just not saying any. that right now it is not free so if you want to give us feedback just tell us hey I, uh, give us ideas for like funding because you know I don't want to do the merch thing myself because if I if I do the merch thing, then I have to handle shipping or I have to pay somebody else yeah. to handle the shipping. So I don't know if I and I don't know if I want to do that right now. But, you know, we could look at like, uh, you know, subscription models maybe of some kind. But I don't know if I want to do like any like tiered things or, you know, just have like a one time payment. Go like here. Here's some free money. I don't care. I don't care for anything special in return. That's the model I would personally prefer because then that allows yes. me to be lazy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But hey, you can always find us at our official website of show.tuckspace.com slash at the at symbol NTA. 
And yep. uh, that is our one official website. I know that you can find us on on iTunes or the Amazon podcast or even Google's podcast or YouTube podcast, whatever the heck they decide to call it now. You can find mm-hmm. us off of those indexes. But we have one true home. <laughs> that is show.tuckspace.com slash at NTA. Before, you can also find the show notes. You can listen to it. Or you can even download the MP3 file manually from there. Or you can even pull directly from our self-hosted RSS feed. <laughs> but anyways, guys, we'll see you next week. Take care. Goodbye.